The spring breeding season is just around the corner, and it's time for cow-calf producers to begin thinking about which vaccines and anthelmintics are needed, and when they need to be administered to optimize herd health and reproductive efficiency. Welcome to this edition of the Beef Roundtable. I'm Dr. Ron Lemonade, your Beef Extension Specialist at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. The Beef Roundtable is recorded live and edited to fit the time constraints of the program. The programs are available at Beef Magazine website, youtube.com, as well as www.beefroundtable.com. And I'm Bert Rutherford, Senior Editor uh, at Beef Magazine. Our first guest today is Dr. Bill Clammer. Dr. Clymer is a rancher near Amarillo, Texas, and a researcher and consultant in uh, livestock parasitology. Bill obtained his PhD in livestock entomology from Oklahoma State University, and in a very long and varied career, he has been an extension specialist with Texas A&M University, has owned and operated his own private consulting and research enterprise, and has been a technical consultant with several animal health companies. Our second guest is Dr. Dan Grooms. Dr. Grooms is a native of central Ohio where he grew up on a small commercial cow-calf operation. He received his BS degree in animal science from Cornell University, his DVM from the Ohio State University, and was in private practice in central Ohio for about five years. He returned to Ohio State and received his PhD in veterinary preventative medicine in 1996. Following graduation, he joined the faculty in the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences at Michigan State University and was promoted to professor in 2011. He is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Microbiologists. His extension and research activities have focused on the control and prevention of infectious diseases in cattle, specifically BVD, Yoni's disease, bovine respiratory disease, and bovine tuberculosis. Dan and Bill, let's start our discussion uh, talking about uh, a pre-breeding uh, plan. When we're getting ready uh, for breeding season, how important is it to have a good vaccination program? And how important is it to have a good uh, uh, deworming and flight control program? Well, well, Bert, I'll go ahead and start off. Um, <clears throat> obviously, uh, the goal of any cow-calf operation is to, is to get cows pregnant. Uh, in an efficient manner, in a timely manner, so and hopefully to keep them pregnant so that they produce calves on the ground because ultimately uh, the, the source of your income is, is the sale or the retention uh, of, of those young calves. So, so making sure that you have a good plan in place to, to, to maximize reproductive efficiency is incredibly important because ultimately that's your life source. And vaccination programs are an important part of improving or um, helping to make sure that you have an efficient uh, reproductive program because there are multiple uh, infectious diseases that can really torpedo your reproductive program. So making sure that those cows are well protected against these pathogens that potentially can cause reproductive failure <clears throat> incredibly important. And to make sure that that protection is done well requires a plan ahead of time. And so that's part of what we're going to talk about is what should that plan look like, making sure that we have those cows well protected against reproductive pathogens so that we protect that developing fetus so that you got feed on the ground come uh, calving season. Bill, what are your thoughts on, uh, on parasite control? There, you know, the internal parasites, actually, we should say all parasites, internal and external, are very important in a production program. It's one of those situations where, you know, one of the main problems we're having nowadays is uh, knowing when to treat and what to treat with. But uh, we need to look at uh, pretty much consider most animals are, are in probably either infested or infected, depending on how which parasites you're talking about. But we need to remember that internal parasites especially cause uh, large economic losses. Uh, we've seen changes in weight gain, uh, just almost astronomical on some of the parasites. Uh, they can introduce secondary pathogens, cause uh, reduced feed efficiency. And one of the things we found out the last few years is that uh, actually that the parasites 
uh, we always used to think they just competed with the animal for the nutrients, but they actually decreased the uh, animal's hungry attitude, I guess you might say. And, uh, they make the animal think they're full and they're going to quit eating. And, and some studies done a few years ago, they found out that cattle that didn't have the uh, parasites controlled actually had uh, probably raised about an hour, nearly an hour less than the ones that uh, were controlling the parasites. And so they're not going to be, you have the anorexia, you have the <clears throat> fact that the animals are going to actually, uh, you know, use part of their energy just to rebuilding the damaged tissue or whatever, depending on which parasite we're talking about. So reduced productivity, which re results in reduced profit, is probably the key to the whole thing. Most of our producers think about vaccinating uh, the cow herd, but what types of vaccine products need to be considered, and when should they be administered relative to the beginning of breeding season? Down? Well, Ron, um, I, I guess to start off with, um, uh, there's there's a lot to that question, and um, w one of the first things that I, I strongly recommend uh, producers to do is to, to work closely with either their veterinarian or with, with other um, animal health consultants that can help design uh, a vaccine program that best fits their operation. And, uh, you know, as we all know, there's probably no one cookie cutter vaccination program for any uh, cow-calf operation, feedlot dairy operation. Um, really, they need to be custom made depending on um, the operation, their management goals, uh, how they're marketing cattle, uh, where they're located, all kinds of variables that are really important to consider when designing that vaccine program. So one thing I, I always encourage people is to work with uh, veterinarians or other animal health consultants to make sure we get the best plan in place for your operation. Um, next thing is um, I think it's really important to consider vaccination programs uh, for both your replacement heifers or replacement animals and then, and then your cow herd because I am a firm believer that good protection of a cow-calf herd, and especially those mama cows, starts in your replacement heifers. So making sure that we get good, solid immunity, establishing those heifers from the get-go is really essential. Because once you establish good immunity in those, it becomes very easy then on an annual basis to reestablish immunity or booster immunity and protect those cows and those developing fetuses. With respects to, um, uh, uh, protecting that fetus or uh, improving efficiency of reproduction. Um, I'm a firm believer in making sure that we vaccinate for pathogens that are important in reproductive efficiency prior to the breeding season. Okay, so so that means trying to get vaccines in the cows between when they calve and then between uh, when breeding occurs. Um, because if you think about it, I mean, we want to optimize uh, uh, immunity, uh, especially during the early part of pregnancy, early to mid part of pregnancy, because that's when that fetus is at highest risk for uh, for uh, death should it become exposed to some type of reproductive pathogen. So I, I often talk to people who are vaccinating cows, you know, in, in the middle or late gestation, I always ask them the question, well, what did, how did you protect that cow during the first third of gestation? And then they start scratching their head and they go, wow, I didn't think about that. So I really encourage people to think about how can we get our cows vaccinated prior to the breeding season so that we optimize as best as possible immunity uh, during um, that early breeding period. Um, the pathogens I think that we need to be concerned about, obviously they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna be specific uh, to farms or maybe even regions in the country or different uh, parts of the world. But in general, there are, you know, there are there's some pathogens that are pretty common, uh, reproductive pathogens that are pretty common to most parts of the United States. Now, there's a couple of viruses, um, IBR and BBD virus. Um, those are common viral pathogens that are pretty much uh, ubiquitous around the country that are known to cause reproductive failure. So we want to make sure that our cows are well protected against those two viruses. Uh, leptospirosis is a bacteria. Uh, which is known to cause both uh, infertility, early embryonic deaths, abortions. And so we want to make sure that our cows are well protected against leptospirosis. 
Um, and then a couple other uh, bacteria, um, may, it may be variable as to whether you're vaccinated against those depending on how you're breeding. Um, one of those is uh, Vibrio. So Vibrio is a venereal disease. And really, probably the only reason you would vaccinate for Vibrio is if, you're, if your total herd is being back, um, uh, bull bred, which certainly is very common. But in AI herds where, where animals are being only artificially inseminated, uh, Vibrio becomes less important. But another bacteria that often is associated with reproductive losses, although the data isn't terribly supportive of that, but which we often incorporate, especially in herds maybe where we're having some reproductive problems, and that's uh, Histophilus or Haemophilus. And so that might be another bacterial component uh, that you might want to include in your pre-breeding vaccination program. The last thing I'll just men mention real quick is, um, uh, especially on the viral side, um, there are there are different uh, kinds of virus vaccines. There are killed vaccines and, and, and modified live virus vaccines. Um, they both have, in my mind, their strengths and weaknesses. Um, however, having said that, I, I'm a, a firm believer that modified live virus vaccines probably provide um, broader uh, uh, protection uh, and, and longer lasting protection. So I'm a fan of modified live uh, virus vaccines in the, in the pre-breeding pre period uh, in cows. And um, certainly there, there are places for killed vaccines and, and they certainly have their place and they have their value. But if I, based on the current literature and based on the current science, if I had my choice, I would use a modified live virus vaccine in that pre-breeding period making sure that we're well protected against BBD as well as IBR, and then also lepto and potentially Vibrio and Histophilus as well. Dan, let me follow up just with a quick question on this. Um, you know, I, we've had some herds that have vaccinated, you know, whenever they put a cedar in or they pull a cedar out. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means we're right on top of breeding season. Yep. And in some of those herds, we've had some fairly low AI conception rates. Okay, so could you talk a little bit about timing relative to the beginning of the breeding season to use these vaccines and when safe, you know, how long do you have to stay away from the beginning of the breeding sure. season, that kind of thing? Sure, great question. Um, so um, so there's, there's not been a lot of research looking at, at how, especially if you're using a modified live virus vaccine, how how that vaccine may potentially impact reproductive efficiency if it's done too close to the, the point of breeding. Um, uh, there, there's some anecdotal evidence out there that says it doesn't affect it, and then there's some other anecdotal evidence such as, as what you just mentioned that suggests that it could uh, affect the problem or affect the reproduction. My general recommendation, um, and this is based on research actually that, that we did it at Ohio State when I was doing my PhD, we do know that both IBR and BVD virus can, um, whether through natural infection or through vaccination, can actually replicate in the ovaries of naive animals, so animals that have never seen that vaccine before. And we know that it potentially can impact um, both uh, developing fetuses and ovaries. Um, so our suggestion typically is to try to get those vaccines uh, into cows or heifers you know, at least two weeks prior to breeding. And that gives um, basically at least two weeks for those cows or those heifers to clear the virus should it be replicating within that animal. So our general recommendation is at least two weeks ahead of breeding. Um, this is really important in heifers and, or animals that are naive. Probably not quite as important uh, at, as uh, to cows that have previously seen the vaccine. So older cows, molly Paris cows that have probably been vaccinated multiple times, but certainly in heifers or naive cattle, um, making sure you're two weeks out prior to breeding uh, would be our general recommendation. Bill, you I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, was, I, I didn't understand your question, I'm sorry. Uh, Bill, you mentioned uh, there are several different parasites, internal and external, uh, and I think many cow-calf producers understand the value of, of uh, deworming their cow herd, uh, but when should they do it, and, uh, and, and what product should they look at, what parasite should they be concerned about? 
Uh, that's uh, and I. Uh, there's several ways to look at this whole thing. You know, one of the really important things is to look at the timing issue, and this goes along with what uh, Dr. Grooms referred to. Uh, you know, one unfortunately, a lot of the bigger operations, uh, you know, they they can't just go get the cattle up every time they would like to do something to them. So you have to kind of try try to tie things together. Uh, one of the biggest issues is how often they, do they need to deworm. And because of resistance issues, and we'll try to mention a little more about those later, but it's real important that that producer uh, uh, probably look at a, a fecal exam program to see, uh, actually have fecals done and uh, determine, first of all, what is the worm burden on those cattle. Uh, we can pretty well assume most of the cattle are going to have some worms, the uh, parasites, however you want to refer to them. But our animals that are six months to about two years old have the heaviest burdens. Uh, as an example, with ostratogy, which is probably the primary one that we're concerned with, uh, on those animals that are six months to two years old, we're going to have somewhere around 300,000 worms in an uncontrolled situation, uh, while the cows are going to have, you know, maybe 15,000 or something like that. But we, and back when I first started, which was many moons ago, we used to say that we didn't need to deworm the cows because it didn't really affect them that much, but they are the the source for the infestations on the calves. So we need to have a, a total deworming program for all the animals. Uh, timing, uh, if you're in the certain areas, like in I live in Amarillo, Texas, and in this West Texas area, and up till this last year we were in a major drought, so our parasite problem. If I was only going to deworm once, it would be in the spring of the year and about what we call turnout or back when the grass starts greening up. And then uh, if I was in the southeast, I would at least deworm in spring and fall. And for the fall calvers, it, the situation is the same. I mean, they just move everything forward to coincide with your with your breeding season and calving season. Uh, but these calves pick those worms up. And the other thing that can happen, too, if you have cattle in a totally naive situation, they don't get exposed to parasites, and that animal gets to be a couple of years old, it affects that animal, even though mature cows that will develop resistance to it, you can actually lose animals from the parasite burden if they weren't exposed. So sometimes a, a few is good, but... Uh, very many is not good at all because at least the autoimmune system will kick in on, on the light populations. But uh, if you have a, a 400 pound calf with 100 eggs per gram, uh, that's going to actually provide, this is with ostratogy, about uh, 690,000 eggs per day that animal's going to be passing out. So uh, there's only going to be about 70,000 of those make it, and this is based on some research done at some of the universities. But it's really important that we get rid of that source of these eggs first. Uh, those eggs hatch, the larvae crawl up on a blade of grass, and so the shorter your pastures are grazed, the more parasites they're going to pick up. But it needs to be a fairly humid situation. And then you get into the, uh, the, the uh, southeast with high rainfall and warm temperatures, uh, some of those places may have to deworm on a regular basis rather than once or twice a year. There's a whole gamut of different products uh, that can be used. Uh, you know, one of the first products we used to deworm cattle uh, many years ago, but and that's probably the only good use I know of it today since I've quit, but chewing tobacco was one of our first dewormers that we had, and that's about the only positive thing I can say about it, although I have to admit that I... I had my turn <laughs> with that as well in my younger days. But anyhow, then we've got, come a long way, and we have several different types. But I would encourage, as uh, Dan said earlier, we need to uh, check. You know, and I can't really make a recommendation you know, to a wide array of geographic areas and as far as audience is concerned because every situation is a little bit different. It's almost different from, from ranch to ranch or farm to farm. But I would encourage uh, all the listeners to check with their local veterinarian and their extension service and see kind of what the problems are in their area and then also think about collecting fecal samples and then if you're having some resistance, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, we need to look at uh, larval cultures to determine exactly what's in those fecal samples. Bill, 
Let me let me follow up with that a little bit. You know, we, we've got injectables, we've got pour-ons, we've got sprays. You know, depending on which parasite, you know, you're going to control feed-throughs. You know, if you're going to control internal parasites, do you like the injectables better or do you like the pour-ons better? Actually, there's uh, looking at macrocytic lactones, which is your uh, what I refer to as a newer class of compound. I think about what '82 was when the first one really came on the market, uh, and those are in several different formulations. But uh, there is a, a little bit of difference. The injectables are on most of the products are just a little bit more efficacious than the pour ones. Uh, but the pour ones, my personal choice is pour ones because we get uh, better louse control, better uh, fly control with. With those pour on, it'll just be for a short period of time, but it will help sure help with some of the external uh, parasites. But the uh, the feed throughs, uh, if you can get the animals will eat it. One of the problems with feed throughs, I think, unless it's uh, you know you'll have some animals that that get four times more than they need, and other animals that don't get as much as they need. Uh, but uh, I've always kind of had the philosophy: if I give it as an injection or pour on, I know how much that particular animal got. You also have a few problems with the pour ons and that the, the animal co-grooming, I'll use that term, uh, it, we've done studies where we actually didn't treat some of the animals in there and they still got 20 or 30 percent of their dose rate just from what they licked off or rubbed off on them from the other animal. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, some of the products uh, are flammable. Uh, we've seen animals actually in at some pretty big functions actually uh, ignited because uh, somebody used a hot shot, and so you have to be a little careful with some of those if they're alcohol based. Uh, others are are not that that bad, but uh, as far as my personal preference, I like the pour ons. Uh, that's one less injection site we have to deal with. Then I'm sure that's something that you're uh, harp on a lot, but uh, so but I also think that there's a lot more benefit from the deworming if you're doing an injectable. Another thing is one of the main reasons we have some failures with these products, and I hate to say this to our, our, our audience, but it's uh, mismanagement from the standpoint of, I know I've met with a lot of producers, particularly up in some of the northern states, and they say, yeah, our cows weigh about 1,250 pounds, and there's not a cow on the ranch that weighs less than 1,400 pounds. So there, if you do the math on that, they're uh, under treating by a uh, you know, pretty large percentage, and uh, these, of course, the, all the companies want to sell as much product as they can, so they're going to have that dosage rate set so it will be, you know, efficacious. But they also, if they set it too high, then they price their product out of the market. And uh, a lot of it's, uh, I always say, there's three ways to control our parasites and it's management, management, management. I mean, there's some things we can do like pasture rotation and that sort of thing. But uh, all in all, it comes down to the fact that uh, we probably need to treat, but we also need to consider the resistance issue. Just uh, one point that kind of confirms what you said. I, I saw a survey back a couple of years ago that uh, done of producers and, and they basically underestimate the uh, uh, their weight of their cows by 150 to 200 pounds. Right, and that's uh, and that's true even with the vaccines. And I'm sure Dr. Grooms will have something to add to that. But uh, you know, I was somebody said, "Well, what's that cow weigh?" And uh, my usual response is, "I missed a chicken one time, 35 pounds." So I'm not going to try to guess the weight of your cows. <laughs> but uh, and another thing that that we did a study uh, a couple of years ago using weigh tapes and we also weighed the animals and uh, we were doing as a uh, Holstein calf study but uh, we using those weigh tapes on those calves and uh, I mean it was all over the board I, I hadn't analyzed that data yet but uh, it's amazing how how many errors there were with the weigh tapes and I think they're better than nothing but uh, not a whole lot better until we you know unless the person using them really knows what they're doing. Hey, Bill, if I can jump in here. Um, sure. I was actually going to ask you about the dangers of underdosing, and you've already kind of suggested that. In fact, we've had some people suggest that, you know, half dose of anthelmintics or dewormers is just as effective as full doses, and so so often they'll, they'll pour that half dose on. 
uh, instead of the whole dose. And so I, I'd like you to comment on, on the potential ramifications, but I'll also follow that up in that we've ha I've had heard the same thing with vaccinations. You know, why, instead of two cc's of a modified, why not, why not just give them one cc? I can double, double my bang for my buck. And the answer to that is that's very dangerous because those vaccines were specifically designed to stimulate immune response based on the dose uh, and the antigenic load that's in that two cc dose or whatever that labeled dose was. So anything less than that's going to precipitate a less efficient vaccine or um, immune response. And obviously that puts the animal and specific to our discussion today, puts that fetus at risk. And so it's really important on the vaccine side. And, and I'd like uh, Bill to, to comment to this. It's really important to make sure that we use the appropriate dose per the label or uh, per the recommendation of a veterinarian um, uh, should should there be something different. So, Actually, that I think the, the difference is, is there probably is no difference, I guess, the best way to put that, because uh, this is one of the reasons that, you know, we, we start out with uh, what we think is a satisfactory dose, and that's arrived at by lots and lots of testing. I mean, the companies spend millions of dollars determining what those dosage rates are, and it gets back to the economics. Uh, they're going to, you know, try to sell their product uh, that will do the job, but they know they can price themselves out of the market. And I, I give you an example. I had a, a producer that uh, uses one of the generic type products, and uh, you know, in, a, in some studies that were done, there was no difference between the the worm population in a uh, untreated animal and the animals treated with this particular generic product. Now, some of the generics are good, and they're good for some pest, but the uh, threshold level, the level it takes to, to kill that worm or, or insect, whatever we're talking about, uh, is very critical, and uh, it's different for different worms. Like there's one or two species of, of the worms that dictate uh, a lot higher dose than, than we would have to use for others. So I would say do, do not, if, I would rather overdose as underdose. And uh, the best thing to do is when you're at the shoot using a pour on or injectable, and it's so many cc's per hundred pounds, uh, error on the side of a little too much, more than a little, not enough. Because if you're uh, this resistance issue that's become very important, everything from horn flies to our internal parasites is is critical because uh, it's called the tail on, on the length of effectiveness. And that's where resistance starts. If you can't kill an insect or a parasite up front, uh, then the, as the dosage rate decreases, uh, the absorptive rate of the, of the actual product that's doing the control, uh, then your chances of resistance. And if you say if you get 80% uh, control of the parasites, that means that 20% of those uh, were probably resistant. And so all the offspring from those are going to, and so your resistance level in your herd may go from having a 5 or 10% of the population resistant to 85 or 90 percent and sometimes it's it's good uh, one reason it's good to have a few worms if it's if you refuse you if the supply of those worms coming in are highly resistant already i mean you can actually bring resistance on your place by you know buying a set of cattle and that's the reason when we buy new cattle we try to deworm them you know, before they ever get turned out to Get, make sure we're not bringing in something that's highly you know, resistant to whatever products we're using at the time. Another question to kind of follow up on both what Dan you said and Bill you said. Uh, I had a, a veterinarian actually uh, tell me that he had some clients that are using like a half dose of, uh, of a dewormer, okay, an anthelmintic. Uh, to control flies during the course of the, the, the grazing season. So they're, they're pouring these cattle multiple times with, at some interval, but they're using a half dose. Comment on that. I, I would uh, address that by saying that in a study that we did, and this is kind of a, a simplified a little bit, it was actually an ear tag study. This was back many years ago before we had any resistance. Where actually, we were just starting to use the uh, synthetic pyrethroids. And uh, we started out, you know, using these ear tags that had been formulated, 
uh, actually did the work at Oklahoma State University with one of my old college professors, and and uh, so that year I, you know, we furnished the tags for him and and uh, used his cattle for counts and that sort of thing. Well, that one year was all I needed to do that study, and and then the next year he called, and I was still doing some work for that particular product in that particular company, and. He said, I, don't you need to do another one of those studies? And I said, well, not really, but uh, I'll get you some ear tags. So I made a phone call and got him some ear tags. And this, we did this about three years in a row. And then the fourth year, he called me back and said, uh, you know, they forgot to put the insecticide in these ear tags. And uh, this was back in the 70s. And uh, that was one of the earlier resistance issues that could we just started testing those that particular compound and so we went from being able to tag uh, two tags in every bull and one tag in every third cow and getting excellent horn fly control to the uh, fact that we could put two tags in each ear and five on their tail and we still didn't get fly control so uh, this i mean it's the same scenario that they they need to uh uh, when that tail, when you drop down below, or you cut that rate in half, it might be controlling the flies, but you're just building resistance as fast as you can on the on the other parasites. Hey, hey, Bill. While we're on this uh, topic of of handling uh, or a proper use of whether it's vaccinations or anthelmintics, um, one thing it might be valuable uh, to talk about with respect to vaccines is making sure we talked about half dose of vaccines not appropriate, half dose of anthelmintics not appropriate. On the vaccine uh, side, it's also important to just remind listeners that, you know, proper use of the vaccines, whether it's proper storage, proper handling, uh, proper administration in the correct location, whether it's sub-Q or IM, depending on the type of vaccine, is really important when it comes to to, to vaccines actually performing. So, you know, making sure uh, vaccines are refrigerated uh, before use. Um, with the modified live vaccines, um, the virus vaccines, those vaccines have to be mixed. So there's a there's a lyophilized or kind of a uh, freeze, um, a dry freeze form and it has to be liquefied. You know, you have about four hours after you mix those vaccines together before they start becoming not very effective. So it's really important to make sure the vaccines are handled and used correctly for them to be efficient. Um, Bill, I don't know about with anthelmintics. I mean, I, I actually, it gets cold enough up here in Michigan that we can actually see bottles of, of uh, products out in the barn that freeze, you know, uh, and then I've often wonder, is that, is that product any good anymore? Uh, may not happen down in your part of the country, but how important is it? Would it be for proper handling of of anthelmintics, uh, storage, and things like that? I think it's it's very very important. You know, as an example, and they're not it's not quite as bad with the vaccines as it is with the parasite control products, because the poor owns and various products and even back looking at dip bat days when we dip a lot of cattle, at least in this part of the world. You know, the products were got stored in a metal barn and, uh, you know, and most people think when you live in Texas, it's banana belt, but uh, they've never been to Amarillo before in January and February, and Bert will testify to that. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, sometimes in the summer, though, we may get, uh, you know, 100 degrees plus, not very often in Amarillo, but uh, uh, you got maybe 150 degree temperature in that metal storage shed or something. Uh, so I really stress for them to store them you know, and we've got a couple of older refrigerators that don't work that we keep the poor owned in, but it's also inside of, you know, the kind of the office uh, area where we've got cheaper vaccines refrigerated and all that. Uh, so they're not stored in that, under refrigeration, but they stay at, at least at room temperature. But there's a very good correlation to decrease in the value of that product, and people look the other thing that, you know, unfortunately, there's so many ranchers that, that you can tell what they're using to vaccinate their cattle with because the bottles are laying on the dash of their pickup. And that's that's a no-no. Now, there's a reason that those products are in, you know, amber-colored bottles and because uh, the sunlight breaks them down. Uh, the temperature will definitely get them. I don't know how hot it gets on the dashboard of a a black pickup in the summertime, but I know you can't hardly set in the seat in one of them. But anyhow, that that's very important. And you know, if something's outdated, it's 
it's not worth the risk. And your vaccines are even more important than, I mean, the, if you don't treat for parasites, you may lose a few animals, but if you don't use the, you know, active, and you don't know that they're, whether they're inactive or not. Um, we had some cattle that I actually had just bought a new bottle of vaccine and I sent it with a, a day work cowboy to treat two or four animals that didn't get caught that day. And, and, uh, I, after I had, it, I had him do that, I was real concerned because I knew good and well that it hadn't been refrigerated and it laid on the dash was pick up for probably a week because that's how long it was before I got back with him. So uh, I hated to, but I threw it out and got another bottle you know, just because I didn't know whether it would be working or not. And then uh, the other thing is it's back to this you know, application. Uh, one of my real pet peeves is like with a pour on, you know, they maybe squirt it on the animal as it goes by coming out of the chute. Uh, for porons to be the most effective, they need to be started to, you know, up on the withers or point of the shoulders and uh, or even clear up a little bit on the pole and bring it all the way back to the tail head. Uh, but I've, uh, I've actually had one employee that left my employment, not by choice, because he was determined. I mean, he would stand on the fence and squirt them as they ran by. And uh, that's not a very effective way. And it, if you put it right on top of the animal's back, it will gradually run down either side of that animal. And uh, for louse control and that sort of thing, because some of the some of the control with uh, external parasites is from contact and not from you know the systemic control on some of our parasites. And then uh, you know even and some of the injectables though are very good on sucking lice, but they won't uh, they won't control chewing lice because they just the chewing lice feed on the hair and skin and skin exudates and the levels aren't high enough in those tissues to to control. But does that? I'm going to ask of, both of I'm going to ask both of you another question. We've talked a lot about different products and that kind of thing and timing and and whatnot. But what about rotating products? Is there any value? Uh, you know, I've always heard that maybe you need to s switch classes of parasite control, okay? Uh, you know, from maybe one application to the next or one year to the next. I don't know if it's as big a deal, Dan, on on vaccines that you switch them. But but both of you comment on on the vaccine or the anthelmintic side about rotating Dan. products. Go ahead, Dan, on the vaccines, because I'll have quite a bit to say on, on the sure. parasite control products. Sure. Um, well, I, I, the uh, the short answer, uh, Ron, is that nobody really knows if ro rotating vaccines would, is advantageous. Um, having said that, um, especially if we look at some of our viruses, I'll, I'll uh, speak specifically about viruses, and spe specifically about uh, uh, BVD virus, there's a, there's a virus that has incredible um, antigenic diversity. So there's a, a variety of different strains out there, and so and we know that one vaccine cannot protect against all those different strains. I mean, there there is some cross protection, you know, that that helps, but but we've demonstrated it here at MSU, and other labs have demonstrated that. Um, if, if you have a BVD virus that's not very closely related to the virus that's in the vaccine or viruses, because most of them have two viruses in them now, um, there's a potential for that, that field virus that's not closely related to, to cause disease or replicate within that cow and cause the cow to get sick or, more importantly, with respect to reproduction, cross the placenta and cause some, some loss. So, um, so one strategy, especially in herds where they may be having problems with BVD virus or maybe herds that are at high risk for BVD virus because they're an open herd and they're constantly bringing cattle in and out, so there's, there's high risk for bringing the virus in or different strains of the virus. I actually talk about rotating uh, uh, vaccines to try to broaden the exposure of those cows to the different strains of viruses that are that are that are out there, and it's based on what's in the vaccines. So, but having said that, there's no good evidence that would suggest that 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 that's beneficial. It's only based on the fact knowing that 
that there's lots of diversity within the DV virus. And if we, ex if we broaden the, the exposure to the virus through vaccines, then hopefully we can protect a little bit against that diversity. But that's just a common sense thinking. There's no good science or, or at least um, uh, nobody's actually proven that, that, uh, that common sense thought. Okay. How's that? The, from a, the parasite side of it, it's, very important, I think, to look at a rotational program. And part of it depends on, the, on what's available. You know, we started out and mentioned earlier about the chewing tobacco. Then, you know, we had what I'll refer to just as the white dewormers, and and those are good. And and you know, they but that kills what's there then, and and then starts all over. I mean, they can get reinfested or infected the next day. Uh, then we came along with when the macrocytic lactones came out. On the internal parasites, I mean, that was the that became the gold standard. And uh, but we have missed, and part of it is producer based, is we've misused it so much. Um, one of the first places you'll see resistance, and on the uh, larger animals is like in goats, uh, is actually, and we actually have recommended a number of times not to even use a particular product when we're working with a particular company on make sure they don't use it on goats because that's where the resistance is going to first start showing up. And that's been pretty much true to form with all the products. And, you know, we think we're changing products and the air tags are the best thing I can use to demonstrate this is, or to illustrate this. Uh, a lot of guys think they change the brand of air tags or they change the color of air tags and they're changing, you know, their rotational program. But you need to look and see what, what the chemicals are that, you know, I was, Fortunate to be one of the first ones in the United States to use the, the synthetic or the uh, uh, synthetic pyrethroid products, and you know we always had good results with natural pyrethroids, but they were too cost uh, too costly to, to use in an agricultural program most of the time. And uh, we found out, my example I gave a while ago about the ear tags, that you know the resistance comes pretty quick, and there actually a number of the universities have developed some pretty good rotational programs uh, because we're now having the, you know, the microcytic lactones, which is the the group, uh, you know, Ivermectinectomax, Epronex, uh, Cydectin, and Long Range. They're all just, you know, fairly new on the market. I think 82 was the first one of those products on the market. So we're getting away from the the uh, synthetic pyrethroids because uh, you can actually, with horn flies, they reproduce, uh, you know, at life cycle about seven to ten days, and uh, they, you know, change, move around a lot too, but we've seen, res I mean, resistance grows really fast with them, but we were finding out we can go back to some of our old compounds and still get control if we have resistance issue, but it won't last as long, in other words, that the resistance comes back. Also, there's an issue with cross resistance. You may, and I mean, if you're using uh, any of the macrocytic lactones, well, actually, there's there's two two different main types: the uh, Avermectin products and the uh, I just threw a total mental blank. Anyhow, the uh, I'll think of it here in a second. But so you've got Avermectin, Dectamax, Epronex, and uh, Long Range are the Avermectin. Uh, and then the Cydectin is the only one I think on the market. There are probably some other generic types, but uh, anyhow, there is, will eventually be cross resistance developed between each one of those products. So, be sure when you're changing, you know, if you're trying to change the program, and you may have to incorporate some other, you know, rotational programs and that sort of thing to help break up that that resistance issue. Uh, the flying insects. Uh, you know, we, horn flies are one of the major problems with the cow producers. Uh, horn flies do definitely affect weight gains and uh, uh, cause a lot of irritation to that animal. You know, some poor graduate student one year had to count every time a cow switched her tail to fight the flies off, and they looked at the energy involved and everything. And actually, the horn flies can be a pretty, pretty ferocious pest to be so small. And then uh, the problems you have there is, you know, we do have that resistance issue. And then we've had changes in the insects themselves from the standpoint of, like, stable flies. Uh, we're named stable flies because they used to were just around the barn and, and the feedlot, or not feed, or not even feedlots in those days. Uh, but then was one major cultural change in our farming and ranching practices 
that has caused the stable fly problem now to become a pasture problem as well. And that's, uh, if you look back, when we first started using round bales, we uh, uh, you know, would leave those where we fed them. And I would have starved to death growing up if we hadn't got to haul hay all summer and, and buck those little, I mean, little square bales. But now with the big round bales, there's enough. And there were some studies done in Texas that uh, we were involved in many years ago that there was over a million stable flies developed in each round bale that was left you know, from the winter, and they didn't clean it up in the spring. So uh, there's some things that we can do there. And one of the first things we do, and it's about the time of the year for us to start doing that, is go in there and not only, you know, move the hay off, but uh, where the hay and manure and everything is trampled in around the hay feeder, uh, you need to clean that up as well and spread it out so it'll dry. And there's three ways to control flies, and this will come into the sanitation, I mean, to the resistance issue, too. But I always tell people, and this is true of internals, only a little bit different approach, but sanitation, sanitation, sanitation. If you'll do any one of those three things for your fly control, you'll pretty well eliminate your, your fly issues. Bill, that sounds like a lot of hard work, sanitation, so. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and, you know, there's, there's never, I, I actually consult with a lot of dairies and feedlots and, you know, major livestock facilities uh, on the fly control part of it, and uh, that's the hardest thing to get them to do. You know, they'll spend thousands of dollars on insecticides when they could go out there with a, a skid steer or, or just a shovel and drain some spots and uh, maybe push manure out from under the, fence or whatever it is and another thing to remember that uh, there's two two figures i'll kind of throw out about probably 85 or 90 percent of the flies develop in about five or ten percent of the area and so if you can this would be the what we refer to as filth flies uh, stable flies house flies and that sort of thing stable flies are more prone to develop and they'd rather have spilled feed or, or decaying hay or something as straight cow manure and then the other side of it is that on the internal parasites, probably about 20% of the cows have 80% of the worms. And so you may have one or two carrier animals there that if you could identify them, take them out of your herd, it would make control a lot easier for the rest of them. But there's, I mean, it's, uh, you can test yourself to death, but, uh, you know, we need to take, take fecals and look at the results and make management decisions based on those results. And they're not very expensive. You know, only need to collect, uh, you know, say uh, 10 samples. And if you've got 10 heads, collect 10 samples. Or if you've got 1,000 heads, still just 10 or 20 samples. And uh, then have a, you know, fecal egg count done on them. Uh, then if you're still having some issues, treat. I mean, do a sample when the day you treat. Uh, look at those. If you still got, comes back two weeks later or three weeks later, and do another peak leg count. And if you still got high numbers, you know you've got a resistance issue, and you need to change products. Well, Bill, the thing then maybe is to invite the uh, the 4-H club or the FFA kids to come out to your place, and that'll give you some incentive to clean it up a little bit. Uh, that that would be good, and if they need extra practice, they can come and start on some of my pens because that seems like the last thing that gets done. But uh, that uh, you know, I, one of the things that's been interesting to me is you know you get we get phone calls and it's always just like with a, a veterinarian situation. It's it's when the crisis is already there. And I've had producers call me and say, "Well, could you come out and what do you charge and all this and and then, they, well, I can't afford that. And then uh, one of the guys called me four or five times, and I said, well, I'll help you out with a on the phone, but uh, I can't just, you know, fly out to another state and, and do that for, you know, very little of nothing. And uh, he kept calling back, calling back, and finally uh, I, I said, well, uh, when are they going to shut you down or when are they filing the lawsuit? And he said, how did you know about that? And I said, well, it wasn't hard to figure out because it, all of a sudden it was about to affect his uh, – this was on a fly control issue in a, in a calf yard, and all of a sudden it was about to affect his uh, whole business, and all of a sudden it became a very, very good issue, and, and he was then willing to get that skid steer or whatever he needed to do to clean up those breeding spots. Dan, um, getting back to, uh, to vaccination, reproductive health, those sorts of things, 
any other uh, thoughts you have, any other management tips that you might be able to pass along uh, in that regard? Sure. Um, well, I think, um, uh, so we've talked a lot about vaccinations and making sure we do that well. Uh, and, and, and we need to plan ahead and make sure that gets done. Um, but I think some other things that, that help to uh, ensure uh, or at least in, improve the, the likelihood that we're going to have a successful reproductive season. Obviously, we, we need to pay attention to those cows and the cow health, um, especially coming out of calving season. Uh, we need to pay attention to their nutrition, making sure that they're they're in good uh, body condition uh, going into the breeding se uh, season. Um, probably really important with your heifers because they're, they're not only are they are they are we trying to get them pregnant uh, and make you know, but we're also continuing to try to grow them as well. So paying attention to nutrition and body condition score on the entire herd is really important. And, and and maybe Ron can comment on you know what's what's the best body condition score coming into the breeding season, but. Um, but I think that that's really, really important because some of the some of the biggest reproductive um, failures that I've dealt with here in the state of Michigan or our, our extension team has built uh, dealt with has, has really been nutritional based. I mean, just cows uh, that had poor nutrition through gestation and then not catching back up uh, prior to the breeding season, just unable to get pregnant. Um, so I think that that's really important. Uh, another thing I guess I, I would encourage producers to make sure is, is to make sure that the, 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 the bull side of your reproductive program is in good shape as well. So whether we're talking uh, you know, live bulls or we're talking about artificial insemination, we need to make sure that, that, that we're in good shape there. If we're using bulls, uh, natural service, we need to make sure those bulls are healthy. We need to make sure that, that, that uh, they've had a breeding soundness exam so that, um, so that come breeding season we know we're at least have reasonable assurance that they're able to get cows pregnant. So highly, highly encourage folks to get uh, their bulls uh, checked prior to the breeding season. Um, and then if, if artificial insemination is a major part of our uh, breeding program, making sure that we have all the supplies necessary to get that done well. We have good nitrogen tanks that, that are filled. Um, if we're using some type of time breeding program, making sure that we have the correct hormones, the prostaglandins, GnRH, make sure they're in date, not out of dated uh, uh, hormones, because we want those hormones to, you know, to work well in, in programming and timing those animals for artificial insemination. So those are all kind of the, the planning that needs to get done ahead of breeding season. So once the season starts, everything's going to, to work well. Dan, you mentioned nutrition and, and, and the one place that I think uh, Sometimes producers want to cut some cost, or um, maybe it's just an oversight in some cases, but that's that's a really good mineral program. And minerals are, my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mineral uh, status of these cows and heifers, and, and actually the bulls too, I mean, if you're vaccinating, uh, you, can, you can spend a lot of money on vaccines and not have them work as effectively as, as you would like if you've got a poor mineral program. Any comments on that? Absolutely, uh, Ron. I agree 100% with that. And in fact, <clears throat> often when I, when I get a chance to go lecture in the animal science courses in, in some of our introductory beef um, uh, beef production courses, and, and I'm asked to talk about vaccine programs, but I always talk about the importance of nutrition and environment and, and management if those things are done well, then I can give you the best vaccine program in the world. I can design the best vaccine program with the right vaccines. But if we don't do the other things well, the vaccine program is not going to work. And certainly nutrition is, is a key component. With poor nutrition or more specifically, uh, you know, uh, poor vitamin mineral uh, programs, um, the immune system is not going to respond properly uh, to the vaccine. So making sure we have those in place, uh, that nutrition program and mineral vitamin programs are incredibly important. And it's also important to have those in place just for proper um, reproductive system function. So, you know, we can have mineral deficiencies, vitamin deficiency, protein deficiencies, and some of the first things they're going to suffer are going to be the reproductive efficiency. So having those done well in place is really, really important. And we talked earlier about um, you know vaccines varying depending on 
example, on, on parts of the country, well, this is really important for mineral and vitamin programs because probably the, the, the mineral and vitamin deficiencies that we have here in the state of Michigan are be much different than they're going to be in Texas or, in, or even in Indiana. So working very closely with uh, extension folks or uh, veterinarians who know, who know the local uh, needs from a vitamin and mineral standpoint is really important to make sure you get, get the right uh, supplements to those animals. Do either one of you have any additional comments or thoughts, uh, any other recommendations on herd health or parasite control uh, that we need to consider as we go into this breeding season? Actually, I've made reference to it a few times, but uh, I think timing on the parasite control is a very important issue, realizing that most of us, uh, especially the larger operations, we're going to try to do everything that needs to be done to that animal once or twice a year, and that's when those cattle are gathered in, you know, to actually vaccinate and deworm and do all that. Uh, and then, in, you know, when also when we wean and, and preg check. So those are very important. But uh, if we, you know, there's the three words kind of like the sanitation, sanitation, the sanitation on fly control. I think both uh, the veterinary side and the parasite side is management, 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 and timing is very important. Uh, there are some times when you may not need to treat uh, your cattle, you know, let's say for fly control, I mean, but it doesn't do any good. And, and like these ear tags, uh, they're very effective and they last for quite a long time, but they have a tail, which means that they gradually decline on release over time. So uh, if you put those on, if you're working your cattle in, in March, let's say, uh, maybe you calve early in January or something and you're working your cattle in March and April, uh, by the time your fly season gets here, it, your product may be just about gone. So if you're, you know, treating then and and uh, you know, and also you need to remove those ear tags when you know when they run out because uh, they're still got some pesticide left in them and it's just contributing more to the resistance issue. But I think uh, timing, uh, the, probably the most important thing they can get out of this session today, I think, is read and follow the label, whether it's a parasite control product for flies or internals or uh, vaccines or whatever. And I, I know I'm involved in, indirectly in a trick situation uh, here a few years ago, and, and the producer was a big rancher, and he said, well, I, you know, his cattle need to be vaccinated twice, and I think that was the only, and it wasn't foolproof, but it was about the only thing we had when this first showed up. And he said, well, I can't afford, I can't afford to treat you know, together my cattle twice, and I said you can't afford not to, because if you don't get this under control, and it's a little more drastic than the, you know the parasite issue. But I said you know you can't continue operating a ranch on a 42 percent calf crop. And so uh, another example on the effectiveness of good management, uh, a friend of mine went to South America and bought a ranch, and uh, when he bought that ranch, they had less than a 40 percent calf crop average. And he went in with some uh, good U.S. technology and, you know, had a vaccine program and, and a parasite control program. And, of course, it was in the, the equator type, I mean, year-round home for the, all the parasites. And uh, he, in about two years, went from a 40 percent or so calf crop to about a, a 85 or 90 percent calf crop just by the technology that he made available. So we need to keep what we have and try to develop new products. But the, the flow of new products on the market is getting less and less because of the mergers of the companies and the, just the sheer cost of developing these products. So we need to try to take care of what we have and continue to use them as long as we can. If I can just reiterate uh, two points that I heard Bill say. Number one, um, the importance uh, of, of, of an entire program, which includes parasite control, includes vaccination, includes good nutrition, its environment. So there's not one um, magic bullet that, that can take care of all your problems. That you really got to work together in a, in a program to, to really maximize uh, reproductive efficiency. Um, the second thing is that there's not one program that's cookie cutter for any one farm or as as bill was referring to it's much different down on in south america than it would be in texas versus michigan so really 
Um, cause I, it's, it's, it's incredible how many times people will come to me and say, well, my friend down in Texas said, this is the way we ought to treat for parasites. And back." And I said, well, that's in Texas and that's a whole lot different than Michigan. I guarantee it. And so people need to understand there's, there's going to be differences depending on the, the type of farm, location of the farm, region of the country, so forth and so on. And that's where you really need to work closely with your, you know, with, with, uh, you know, folks that, that understand, um, issues in your part of the country. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Bee Farm Table. Bert and I would like to thank our guests, Dr. Bill Clymer and Dr. Dan Brooms, for their insight into the vaccination and deworming strategies as we get ready for the spring breeding season. Please join us again next month for another Beef Round Table discussion. It will be a great program. Until next time, Bert and I hope you have a safe and rewarding month.